the first lecture in this Gazing into the Past series was about a great and famous painting by the late Yuan Dynasty artist Wang Meng. And in it, I showed besides uh, that one of his, uh, that one at great length and in great detail, I showed a few others for comparison. For this one, the seventh in the series, I'm going to be returning to Wang Meng and showing more of his works. One of them, a well, long hand scroll, again at considerable length in both senses and with many details. But first I want to speak about the so-called four great masters of the Yuan dynasty more generally. The first image, please. Two paintings by Wu Zhang, both river landscapes with fishermen, both dated to the early 1340s, both in the Palace Museum in Taipei. As I related in an earlier lecture, I meant to write about all four of the four great masters uh, as my dissertation topic, and I began with Wu Zhang, meaning to finish him off fast and then get on to the others, who were more interesting as artists. Wu Zhang raised, interestingly, the problem of the so-called amateur versus professional artist. The distinction, while it's far from clear, is important for this period, having a lot to do with the kinds of paintings that they do. Wu Zhan, so the story goes, lived near a professional artist named Sheng Mo. Next, please. This is a fine painting by Sheng Mo, taken from a color plate in my Hills Beyond a River book. It's in the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City, bought by Larry Sickman, who was, as I've said many times, far ahead of the rest of the field in his purchases of Chinese paintings. And it is, I would say now, this painting by Sheng Mo, a much more interesting painting, at least for me, than either of the two Wu Zhuns. Wu Zhan is endlessly repetitive in his subjects and styles, river landscapes, bamboo and ink. Sheng Mo, on the other hand, is endlessly inventive, and so forth. This isn't a matter that I want to expand on now. I simply make the observation. According to the story, to go on with that, Wu Zhan's wife complained that people were going by their house all the time toward Sheng Mo's house, wanting to get paintings from Sheng, while nobody much stopped at their house. Wu Zhan is supposed to have replied to her, Don't worry, in 20 years it will all be different. And so the story goes, it turned out. As I have uh, begun to say over and over, the literature of Chinese painting is largely made up of stories and arguments supporting the scholar artists over the professionals. And this is one of those stories. Okay, next please. Two paintings by Ni Zan, Palace Museum in Taipei and Shanghai Museum respectively. I won't bother with dates and titles. Ni Zan is another who develops a favorite type and then repeats it endlessly with interesting variations. His paintings and another familiar story became highly desirable to the point where the prestige of a family in the Jiangnan region, the Yangtze Delta region that is, was determined by whether or not they owned a painting by Ni Zan, whether that is they had taken him in as a guest and had him do a painting for them or otherwise obtained one. Again, this is an argument for the superiority of scholar amateur painting endlessly told and mindlessly accepted over the centuries. Next. Ni Zan's manner of painting, or at least his manner of painting simple scenery and dry brushwork with no color, is taken up by artists of the Anhui region in the 17th century, who were working mainly for a merchant class patronage, who had been persuaded by critics of the time that collecting this kind of painting would give them prestige, elevate their cultural status, much like the situation of Nizan in the late Yuan. These are developments and issues that I explored with my students during my teaching career. They were crucial issues in our field at that time. We needed to understand and absorb these traditional Chinese arguments before we could, as I am doing now, come to realize how limited they are in their application, how biased toward certain kinds of painting and dismissive of others. The other two of the four great masters, Huang Gung Wang and Wang Meng, were far more interesting artists, I think, which is why I'm now devoting long lectures to them. The third in this series was on Huang Gung Wang, and this one, as I began by saying, will be another on Wang Meng, showing and discussing more of his paintings. Next. And I begin with one of the least interesting, of which I don't have a good digital image anyway, only the one taken from the web with the detail from an old slide. 
This is a work titled Secluded Dwellings in Summer Mountains, and it's a small painting, 57 by 34 centimeters, painted in ink on silk. It's in the Freer Gallery, purchased in 1945 when I was there. I recommended the purchase because it's the earliest dated work by Wang Meng that I know, painted in 1354. It's a fairly standard dwelling in seclusion picture, with a man in a waterside house gazing out, seen in the lower center, and another man arriving over the bridge to visit him. The detail is from the upper right, and it shows Wang Meng's usual heavy buildup of distant hills and mountains with a few houses at their base. But I'm certainly not going to attempt a chronological account of Wang Meng's development as a painter. I don't have enough images or enough patience anymore to attempt anything like that. Instead, I revert to the autobiographical mode that runs through these lectures, as you know by now, showing these familiar photographs, myself with the photographer Henry Bevel and others at the old Palace Museum storage area outside Taichung in 1959, and a photo of the storage room with the paintings and other objects still in the crates in which they had been shipped from Beijing. I had visited the storage site in 1955 while I was a Fulbright student in Japan to see paintings for my dissertation. And then later with Cici si Wang and Li Lin San, the two of them are seen here at the far left of the group, I had the extraordinary opportunity to go through a big part of the collection to choose paintings for my scarab book. But of course our purpose was far larger than that. It was to discover neglected paintings uh, the collection had scarcely been gone over by anybody outside the Palace Museum at that time. And especially, we wanted to open up the group that were called the Gen Mu, or the Simple List, the ones that were supposed to be not genuine or not worth looking at. Um, three would-be connoisseurs living in Taipei, the politicos Wang Shi Jie and Luo Jia Lun, along with their collector friend Zhang Gu Sun, who depended heavily on reading inscriptions and seals for his judgments, as they did. These three had been making weekend trips down to Taichung to go through all the collection to divide it into the main group, consisting of the genuine and good paintings, as they believed them, which would be cataloged in the Zhang Mu section of the catalog, the main list, and the lesser or fake paintings, which would be in the Jian Mu or Simple List at the back of the catalog, listed only by artist and title. Uh, they had made a great many mistakes, consigning many fine and important paintings to the Jian Mu to be stored in crates that could not be easily opened, even by the Palace Museum staff, headed by Director Zhuang Yan, uh, who knew better, but who couldn't easily display the paintings, much less publish them, because to do that would be calling into question the connoisseurship of their political superiors. So the Palace Museum staff was entirely supportive of our effort to break open this forbidden group. This story is told, by the way, in CLP 117 on my website, the place of the National Palace Museum in my scholarly career. Next, please. I relate the story again to introduce one of the many genuine paintings that we found in these in this Genmu group, a Wang Meng hand scroll titled Jirlan Shi Tu, or the Villa of Iris and Orchids. It's a short hand scroll painted in ink and colors on paper, which I was able to publish for the first time in a color plate in my Hills Beyond a River book, where you can see it. Uh, the first section, about half of the whole composition seen here, uh, depicts the villa or the retreat built on the bank of a stream near a waterfall. Next, please. As the scroll opens, we see the owner of the villa, presumably a, a, the bald figure in monk's robe, sitting on a ledge by the waterfall with a guest, a secular figure with hair who sits on a mat and holds his hands clasped in front of him as if in prayer. A striking fi feature of the painting style is the heavy application of dian or dotting, sometimes along the edges of earth forms, but much of the time seeming to vibrate apart from them giving a strong surface vibrancy or visual excitement to the whole image. Next. We can recall that in some late Song paintings, such as Liang Kai's painting of Tao Yuanming walking, from which this is a detail, uh, or, next please, 
The two landscapes in the Kotoen, wrongly associated with Li Tang, really late Song works, in these the Dian had begun to be applied as clusters of large dots, already seeming somewhat detached from the landscape forms, serving rather to energize the whole picture with this kind of surface agitation. Next. In some works by Shertau, the great late 17th century individualist master whose work was the subject of the previous lecture in this series, masses of vibrating dian or dots come to dominate the picture, scarcely seeming attached to any solid forms at all, as in this detail from his hand scroll titled Ten Thousand Ugly Ink Dots. Next. Wang Meng in such works as this one makes an important and brilliantly original stylistic move toward this use of dian dotting as a stylistic feature somewhat independent of representation, purely a visual stimulus. Wang Meng, like Huang Gung Wang, was an artist who could bring major new stylistic ideas into Chinese painting, as neither Wu Zhan nor Ni Zhan really could, or at least chose to do, as they're in their quieter works. I've tried throughout these lectures to bring out, whenever I can, the distinction between artists of truly great creative powers and those who only achieve a manner of painting that's highly regarded because of critical preference or uh, critical bias. Next. Moving in closer to the main subjects in this first section, we see the monk owner and his guest at far right, with a servant approaching them, carrying something that looks like a martini glass, but probably isn't. The house is open-fronted, and a figure of the Buddha on a stand is seen inside, with another servant at far left. Lined up just inside are pots with, growing in them, the plants that the residence is named for, Lan Hua, or the Chinese orchid, recognizable even when depicted so small. Outside, lined up on the outer edge of the flat bank, is another row of potted plants. These must be the jur, the iris of the title. Above and behind, more open rooms can be seen in the second story, which must be the monk's living quarters. So, in this modest picture is a detailed account of how this monk lived, how he entertained guests and the beloved potted plants that he cultivated, and after which he named his residence. At the far left of this image is what appears to be a vertical bank of earth, covered with masses of large black dien, which here must represent the foliage of bushes or trees. Next, please. This introduces the second half of the scroll. My images may not include its entirety, but most of it is here, which presents us with what it seems what at first seems a solid surface of busy brushwork, dominated by heavy dotting, but also revealing, as we look longer, recognizable trees with exposed trunks, branches, and green foliage. What appears to be a recession at the top with trees growing on it. And what finally attracts our attention, next, three openings, two of them with servants moving leftward, carrying things through what must be tunnels or caves, and a larger one through which we see the owner of the Jerlan Shur, again, seated with three guests, two monks and a lay figure, who listens. The smaller two monks are turned toward the larger figure, the master, who is holding forth with his hands raised so much conveyed in what looks at first to be such simple drawing, and how we can appreciate and envy the kind of quietly eventful social and cultural life that must underlie such a picture. It is, of course, idealized. How the monk really lived, we can't say, except perhaps by translating the inscriptions and reading whatever writings about him survive, which is a task for the text readers. Perhaps it's already been done, unknown to me. What I care about here is what Wang Meng has told us so engagingly in his painting. Next, please. After having written the foregoing in my lecture notes, I turned to take my old Hills Beyond a River book off the shelf to read what is said about the painting there, and I found quite a lot. The younger James Cale was a much better text researcher than this old one, and he did his work properly, bringing together lots of information about the painting and its subject. There's a title written by Wang Meng, it turns out, at the beginning, and Wang Meng's signature at the end, neither of them included in our images. The monk who owned the villa was named Gu Lin, and his dwelling was near Hangzhou. 
The evidence is that Wang Meng painted this late in his life, uh, around the same time as a painting titled Forest Grottoes at Juchu, which I'll show next. And a long essay by Wang Meng is mounted after the painting in this scroll. I translate quite a lot of it and summarize the rest in my book. But since my approach in this lecture series is strongly visual, I won't read all that, but I'll simply refer you to pages 125 to 127 in Hills Beyond a River, or for those of you who read Chinese more easily, pages 139 to 141 in the Chinese edition, where the painting is reproduced in black and white only. Next, please. The painting referred to there as done around the same time is this small hang scroll titled Forest Dwelling at Juchu. The person for whom it was painted was probably a Buddhist monk named Rurjong. The place depicted was located on the shore of the Taihu, or the Great Lake, outside Suzhou, where the action of the lapping water had eroded the rocks into strange shapes. This is the source of the Taihu Shur, or Taihu Rocks, that are set up as ornaments in Chinese gardens. But I don't want to talk about the painting until I have good details, so I'll save it for later. It's discussed, and the evidence for its being a late work is given in Hills Beyond a River, where you can read about it. I do want, however, to read the last paragraph from my discussion of it, for what it says about Wang Meng's career and his importance as an artist. It's another of those passages that I couldn't write today, or certainly couldn't write the same way anyway. So here we go. This is from page 120, 125 of Hills Beyond a River. Amid this turbulence, the human figures appear as calm and unconcerned as ever. If we could somehow uh, disregard Wang's settings and look only at the figures in architecture, they would seem scarcely to change from the beginning of his career to the end. They are constants, but around them the world undergoes a profound transformation, dissolution, one could even say destruction. How can Rurjong have understood this disturbing portrayal of his house by the lake. Did he, did, he, did he and the artist share some interpretation of it as a visual metaphor for the situation of the Confucian intellectual in a disordered age? Or did he display it to his relatives and friends as something done for him by, quote, that very odd Mr. Wong who can't seem to paint things the way they look, end quote. However that may be, Wang's engagement with the agonizing circumstances of the late Yuan and early Ming seems to be as clearly reflected in his paintings as is Ni Zhan's disengagement in his. The very visual excess and textual surfeit of Wang's works by involving the viewer intensely but making the experience so uncomfortable seems to present at once the urgency and the danger of such engagements. Okay, enough for that. To go, now going on. A few more Wang Meng paintings shown briefly before we turn to the three that this lecture is mainly about, which will occupy us at greater length. This one, for which I have only a good detail of the lower section, the image of the whole is copied from Saran, page, plate 110 left. This one is titled A Thatched Cottage in the Western Field and it represents a type of which Wang Meng must have done many versions. Like Ni Zhan, but with more variety and imagery in his paintings, he did pictures of people's residences or retreats in return for hospitality or other kinds of support. This was normal for the scholar artist who had achieved enough reputation for his works of this kind to be in demand. Owning such a painting and displaying it to one's guests, who might be invited to write inscriptions on it, was a source of pride for well-off people. The owner is typically shown as here, seated in his study reading. A boat outside indicates the option he has of moving off into the larger world when he chooses to. Next. Two smaller paintings, both painted in ink only on paper, turned up later in the Shanghai Museum after I had compiled my index so that they are not included there. This one is signed simply by the artist and bears inscriptions poetic quatrains signed and with seals by two contemporaries, three people collaborating on a work to be presented to someone. Next. At the bottom of the picture, a man in a thatched tingza beneath pines gazes at a waterfall. Above, a road leads diagonally upward 
to a cave with two figures in it. This simple imagery would, of course, have had some significance for the recipient of the painting. The execution of the painting must have been done quickly, with line drawing and lots of dotting. This must have been typical of Wang Meng's lesser productions. The next. Also in the Shanghai Museum, this one is inscribed by the artist as painted for Chun Wei Yin, a well-known person of his time, brother, if I remember right, of Chun Ru Yen, whose hao was Wei Yun. There was a time when I knew all of these Yuan literati and their works in detail. They will be familiar to some viewers who work in this field, but identifying them in detail is, isn't, is not part of our present program. On the mountainside among trees is a kind of hut woven of bamboo, perhaps, with two figures seated in it. And a man is seen below crossing a bridge. If there is a certain similarity between the compositions of these two paintings and the imagery in them, this is because Wang Meng is using familiar materials. The large trees at bottom right and the stream flowing out from a pond make up a standard opening for literati landscapes, seen endlessly in their works. Next. Deserving of more attention as an original and complex composition is Wang Meng's Chun Shan Tu, or Spring Mountains, picture in the Shanghai Museum, reproduced as figure 108 in Saran and in many other books. I have no less than 12 high-resolution details of this, made from the original painting many years ago, and I'll show them reading against the standard Chinese practice from top to bottom because the most interesting parts of the buildings and figures are in the lower part, and I want to save them for last. The composition to begin with, to begin with that, the composition to begin with that is made up of materials pushing diagonally upward and apart the hilltops and below the pine trees. This leftward rightward push ends at the bottom with two groups of houses and figures, which as we'll see are also separated into left and right. A simple scheme, but unusual, and carried out with lots of variety and originality. A long inscription by the artist is in the upper left. Unfortunately, I don't have anything in my notes or in my index about what it says. It's presumably a poem with some references to the places depicted and the person for whom Wong painted the picture. Next. A close-up of the hillside reveals how Wang Meng has here used richly varied applications of dian dotting from lightest to dark, overlapping in disorderly masses, unpatterned, for an especially effective approximation of visual phenomena, how the eye would see distant vegetation on a hillside. Once more, we might think ahead to the ways in which the Impressionist painters of Europe were to make their pictures look naturalistic by avoiding the neatly sharp-edged look of traditional painting suggesting the blurring of distance. Something like that is being done by Wang Meng here. Next. A further out view that reveals the bifurcating character of the composition as the ridges push upward to the left and right and the pine trees below repeat this movement in their growth. At the middle right we can see past the steep ridge into the further distance where a house with a figure in it appears on a distant shore. Next. Closer up, this is seen to be an open house with a man, or a figure anyway, seated in it, set among trees with straight trunks and pointed tops, some kind of pines perhaps. This building may be part of the living complex that's shown below, possibly a house for a servant. Next. Moving still closer in, we see that the figure is kneeling in front of some kind of apparatus. Is it a woman engaged in weaving on a frame? Someone else more familiar with Chinese material culture can probably identify it. I cannot. The close-up detail reveals also that Wang Meng has suggested a further building with a vertical line pattern seen between trees above, representing some kind of lattice on its exterior. It's only when we move in close in this way, with images of the kind that these lectures can offer, that we come to realize the riches that Wang Meng has provided us. Reproductions in books reveal little beyond the whole composition and the placement of a few buildings and figures. Next, please. The large pine trees that occupy the center of the composition with their bifurcated push upward, when seen closer up in this way, prove to form a dynamic pattern 
uh, in their trunks and branches and upward pointing bunches of needles. We're seeing the painting more or less as we might look at it faced with the original, moving in and out, upward or downward, bending in to look more closely at some visually absorbing area. Next. And here, with an image of the whole lower section, we come to the narrative center, the principal dwelling with buildings and figures. And this too, perhaps not surprisingly, is separated into left and right areas of visual interest, drawing our eyes sideward to look into the open buildings and see the figures in them. They are parts of a single dwelling complex, presumably meant to represent the residence of the man for whom Wang Meng painted the picture. The main houses at left with a figure seen in one of them, a waterside pavilion at right with the largest figure seen in that. Next. The cluster of houses, one shown above another, moving back, all with thatched roofs and windows protected with vertical wood members on the outside, presumably with paper pasted inside that let in the light while protecting the privacy of those in the house. Panes of glass are, of course, far in the future. At least four such buildings are shown here, stretching back, and perhaps the roof of another seen through the trees. Next. Viewed up close, the nearest building reveals two rooms open, the rightward one set back and containing only a flat table, a stool, and beyond them a screen. This is the main entrance to the house. The left room is a man's study, built out over the water with a low railing around it. The man is seen sitting at his desk with an open book in front of him, and what are probably brushes in his hands. Two more brushes and an inkstone are also on the desk before him. This cannot be the main residence, whom we will see in the waterside pavilion, and who will have a heavy mustache. This may be one of his sons. The identity of the people would have been obvious to the original recipient of the painting and to his friends. Next, please. And here, finally, we arrive at the true main focal area of the painting, the thatched pavilion overlooking the water, viewed beyond rocks and a large pine tree, a broad path with horizontal markings that appear to be planks laid on it, leads up to the pavilion from the lower right, where we should perhaps imagine a mooring place for the boat of a visitor, or a boat that will carry the man away when he wants to travel. Next. In this, our final image for this painting, we see at last the figure of the man around whom the whole composition is organized, the largest figure in the painting, the most individualized, with a heavy mustache and perhaps a beard. He is attended by two servants, one of them partly hidden by the trunk of the pine. They stand ready to attend to his wishes, whatever they may be. He raises his face as if striking a pose, as if aware of being looked at. We can recall similar figures in Sung period paintings of men seen in open houses. And we can imagine the feeling of pleasure that the owner of villa, the villa must have felt as he gazed at this painting and focused in on this detail, and recognized in the figure Wang Meng's ideal image of himself. And with that observation, I end this long visual exploration of a major work by Wang Meng. The second part of this lecture will consist of detailed looks at two paintings by Wang Meng, uh, a hanging scroll in the Palace Museum in Beijing, and a hand scroll in the Liaoning Museum. Both of them are reproduced and discussed in my chapter on Yuan Dynasty painting uh, in the 3,000 Years book. When I planned that book with the Yale University Press people, I deliberately assigned Yuan painting to myself because I knew of quite a few fine Yuan paintings and PRC collections that were little known and that I could include. This one, now on the screen, the hanging scroll in the Beijing Palace Museum, represents Gudger Tran moving his dwelling. It's painted in ink and colors on paper. It's 139 by 58 centimeters in size. And as you see immediately, it's unlike all the other Wang Bang paintings that we've seen, in that it's painted with lots of finely drawn detail all over its surface. It's undated, but from its style, I'd place it in his great middle period, the 1360s. From the artist's long inscription on it, we learned that it was done for a certain Rurjong, probably the same man for whom he painted the forest dwellings at Juchu, which we saw a bit ago, or the previous part. 
Why he would paint this particular subject for Juchu remains a mystery. In later times, paintings of people moving were sometimes given to people who were going, going through that experience themselves. Next. An image of the lower part, the same that's reproduced in color in the 3,000 Years book, along with the whole. Gudger Tran was Ge Hung, who lived from A.D. 283 to A.D. 343, and he was one of the early Taoist alchemists, the author of a famous book, Bao Puja. Uh, at one point in his life, he traveled to Guangzhou, or Canton, meaning to continue further south in search of cinnabar for refining the elixir of immortality. But prevented from continuing by the local governor, he ascended the nearby Mount Lawfall and prepared his elixir there. The hidden valley with buildings in the upper left of this composition, which represents his destination, may be intended for his dwelling on Mount Lawfall. On another level, as I explain learnedly in the 3,000 Years text, the composition echoes paintings of Dawa's transcendence ascending to heaven with their entire families. I cite there one Taoist Shenron who did this. Next, please. This is the main figure group from another painting by Choi Zhong of a similar subject, but with a larger group of travelers. This one is in the Cleveland Museum. I believe it represents the same Shu Chung Yang and his family, but I'm not sure. Next. I myself use this painting by Choi Zhong, much simplified, as the basis for a linoleum block printed postcard I made and sent out to all my correspondents when I moved with my family to Berkeley in 1965 with the news and our new address on the other side. My then wife Dorothy rides the ox holding young Sarah and Nicholas leads my ox, which has on its flank the mark of the Volkswagen, which was a real means of travel at that time. I was much given in those days to elaborate learned jokes. Next please. Back to Wang Meng's painting. The drawing, as we see when we move in still closer, is unusually careful and detailed. No expressive brushwork here, or semi-abstract applications of large yen. The painting reveals what a high-level technician Wang Meng was, among other things, and how he transcends the self-expressive brushwork aesthetic within which artists like Wu Zhang and Ni Zhang largely remained. Next. Gudger Tran is seen midway across a bridge, one hand resting on the back of his companion, a deer. He looks back to be sure that his family is coming along behind him. One of the porters carries their luggage, walking ahead of him. Two others with bigger loads are sitting on the bank across the stream. Next, closer up. The portrayal of the Taoist adept is itself masterly. His air of authority and transcendence of worldly concerns is somehow caught in his posture, his face with piercing eyes above slightly reddish-tinted cheeks. He carries a feather fan. The contrast with the low-class porter strengthens the almost monumental image of Gudger Tran. Notice how easily and effectively Wang Meng indicates the swirling of the water around the rocks behind him. Next. A detail from below the bridge shows how this careful and masterly attention to detail continues everywhere in the painting, the swift flow of the water between the supports of the bridge, which are themselves depicted so that we understand completely the construction of that bridge, the eddying of the water around strongly shaped rocks. Next. Behind and below Gudger Tran are his family and other servants. One servant approaches the bridge, another older leads the ox carrying an old woman, perhaps his principal wife, who holds a young child, presumably a son. Two younger women, perhaps concubines, follow behind. This image is conventional and will be used more or less similarly, more or less the same, in similar paintings in later centuries. Notice the meticulous drawing of the leaves on the trees, the smaller one just behind and above the figures, and uh, next please, the larger ones further back, filling the whole lower left corner of the composition, a strongly shaped nearer tree with knots from broken off branches and rich foliage, another trunk wound with vines behind and to the left, 
others behind to the right. We need to recognize, as we haven't before, how completely and effectively Wang Meng, who was a scholar amateur master, continues the great Southern Sung Academy tradition of painstakingly representational painting, that is, when he chooses to do so. Next. As we continue to follow the narrative route that our family group will take into the landscape, we come to the further shore where two servants are sit resting, a younger man and an older one, both with heavy loads. Prominent in these loads are the necessities for any scholarly man, wine gourds, books, and scrolls. The road continues around the vertical cliff behind them. Next. We move now into the upper part of the painting, beginning with this general view and an image of the right part. Here again we are impressed with how much Wang Meng has learned and absorbed from earlier painting, including, we have to assume, the spatially complex landscape paintings of the 10th and 11th centuries. Back in our first lecture in this series, I showed how a certain distinctive form, a dog's head-like projection from a mountainside, could, this is in the um, Qingbian Mountains painting, could be seen in a reliable 10th century landscape, the Liao tomb painting, and, um, and in Wang Meng Qingbian Mountain landscape also in the upper right. Just to start again. Similar comparisons could be made to show the early sources of some features of this landscape, the flat top projections, the parallel fold recessions along mountainsides, the careful texturing of the surfaces. A waterfall presumably provides the source for the stream that we saw flowing into the foreground. In this horizontal view across the upper part of the painting, we can connect the monumental landscape passages we've just seen and the waterfall with the continuations of the travel narrative at left. The road we saw at the bottom continues upward with a railing along its outer side and reaches above the entrance to the compound of buildings that is their des destination. Next. A destination seen fully in this vertical image. Smaller trees, looking as though they had been planted, line the road and lead the eye up to a fenced enclosure in the upper left and we see the main entrance of the compound of buildings that is to be Gudger Trans dwelling on Mount Lawfall. Next. Um, and here finally is a close-up view of that destination. A fence made of vertical poles is open and a boy servant stands ready to welcome them. In a gateway building behind is another servant. To the left is a thatched viewing pavilion or Tingzu where Gudger Tran and his friends will sit and gaze out over the mountain scenery now below them. This is the final refuge, their Shangri-La, toward which Wang Meng has been conveying us visually. What a pleasure it must have been for Ru Zhang and his friends to hang the painting and enjoy it at length, imagining themselves ascending into safety from the political and military turmoil that was in fact surrounding them and would, as I recounted in the previous Wang Meng lecture, would soon bring the dynasty to an end. Next. Our last Wang Meng painting, the hand scroll in the Liaoning Museum, shown here in full, represents the approach to a temple, from right to left, as always in viewing a hand scroll. And since the implied narrative takes us from the gate marking the entry to that approach at far right to the temple itself at the far left, I want to recount briefly the closest experience that I myself have had in making that kind of pilgrimage-like long approach, ascending the roadway leading up to the Kyoshi Kojin Seichoji Temple, located in the hills above Takarazuka in Japan, which I visited many times and where I stayed many days. Next. Uh, here first is the guide map in the back of the temple's guidebook for those who want to visit the temple. The railway line across the lower part, shown in dotted line, is the Hankyu line from Osaka to Takarazuka Station, which appears at the far left. The heavy dark line crossing the map above is, the, is a highway for those who want to come by car. The train stop, marked with a circle and a Torii gate sign above, above it, is the Kyoshi Kojin Iki, or station a stop on the local train 
where those making the pilgrimage to the temple will get off and begin their ascent along the Sando, or pilgrimage way. It was, and presumably still is, lined with shops, places where one can stop for lunch or tea, establishments of all kinds that cater to the needs of the visitors, shops that sell little gifts and so on. The circled area above is the parking lot for those who come by car, and a shorter sando, lined even more intensely with shops, leads from there to the temple. I remember many times walking up it and stopping to buy small gifts at the little shops along the way to take home, or at a place that made shichimi, a combined spice called Seven Flavors, which one received in a section of bamboo with a hole bored in it and a plug in it. I brought many of these home with, from, from, from my trips to use or for gifts. Uh, next. This is what one sees as he comes closer to the temple. Stone lanterns along the sides, the gateway ahead. Somewhere along the way is a graveyard where the old Bishop Sakamoto was buried. I was there through the whole funeral and burial, which took most of a day. A great experience. Next. The entrance of the temple, a gate with steps beyond. The stone marker at right is inscribed with the name of the temple, which is the center of a special sambo, or three treasures, form of the Shingon sect of esoteric Buddhism. But the temple and the hilltop site are also, from long ago, the home of a local deity named the Kyoshi Kojin, who is the main attraction for the crowds who come there to pray, pray to this god, for various blessings. Since the Kyoshi Kojin is especially devoted to watching over seafarers, the big shipping companies of the Kansai region contribute heavily to the temple, which is very rich. Next. It's not to our purpose to do a tour of the temple, and I'll show only this one building, which is the one where I always stayed during my many visits to the temple, but lasted sometimes for several days, or once as long as a week. I once spent a long time seeing all the Tessai paintings they own day after day. Anyway, that's another story. I was working with them on foreign exhibitions of the artist Tomioka Tessai, an artist who died in 1924. Um, but that also belongs to a long story that I'll tell at another time, showing Tessai paintings. Next, please. Here I'm seen with the old Bishop Kojo Sakamoto, whose great mission in life, apart from his properly Buddhist function, was to propagate the greatness of Tessai as an artist. He, uh, he had known the artist slightly, and as a force for world peace, as he saw him, throughout the world. He came to New York for two weeks during the great Tessai exhibition that I organized at the Metropolitan Museum in New York in 1957, uh, and I was with him pretty much the whole time as his companion and interpreter. Next. And here, finally, is a photo from a later time in which I'm seen sitting inside the temple with the young bishop, Sakamoto Koso, who succeeded the old bishop. At our left is Tomioka Masutaro, the artist's grandson. Hanging behind us at far left is a photo of the old bishop, and behind us at right, one of Tessai's great paintings, a landscape with rainstorm, hung there because they knew it was a favorite of mine. But that, as I say, is all another story for another time. Back now to Wang Meng and the Liaoning hand scroll. Next. Here it is rolled out at full length, an artificial image since Chinese hand scrolls were never rolled out in this way. As usual, the title comes first at the far right, four large characters reading Taibo Shan Tu, or Picture of Mount Taibo, meaning the temple located at the foot of that mountain range. Then the painting, painted in ink and bright colors on paper, 27.6 centimeters in height, 236 centimeters, or nearly two and a half meters, in length. It's followed by a series of colophones, inscriptions by monks of the early Ming period, dating between 1388 and 1417. Seals on the painting include those of such famous collectors as Shanzhou, Xiangyuanbian, Liang Qingbiao, and Anqi, or Ani Zhou, um, and, of course, those of the Chenlong Emperor, uh, who more or less appropriated these great collections into his, his own imperial collection. Next, please. And here at last is the first section of the scroll itself, seen in an original slide. 
I made 30-something slides uh, when we were shown this scroll at the Liaoning Museum. I think it was on our 1973 trip. And so I'll be able to recreate for you the experience of seeing it at arm's length, then bending down to look closely at details, the way hand scrolls were really looked at in China by those fortunate enough to own them or be shown them as a guest of the owner. This is the way the artist meant the scroll to be seen. This first section opens with a view of distant hills and a seashore or lakeshore in upper right. In the upper right corner is the title written in seal script by the artist himself. The big oval seal and the long inscription written in the sky are, as usual, by this Chenlong emperor, and we'll have to do our best to ignore them. Unlike the new Chinese millionaires these days who are paying big money for paintings with these same imperial markings on them, however dull the paintings might be. Next. Here are the distant hills, going back from the closer one, textured and with autumnal colors, to progressively fainter and paler ones. A boatman sculls his boat, carrying some cargo toward the shore. The range of hills or mountains are the Mount Taibo, uh, or Taibo uh, Mountains, or Mount Taibo Hills, perhaps, of the title. Uh, located near Ningbo, the coastal city east of Hangzhou. Wang Meng painted the scroll for a Chan or Zen monk named Yun He. The temple at the end is the Tian Tung Si, or Temple of the Divine Child. Next. Below, seen through a dense and richly colored screen of tree foliage, is the village of Thatch Buildings, located just outside the gateway that is the proper entrance to the pilgrimage way, it was probably made up mainly of shops catering to the needs and wants of the pilgrims, like those that line the Sando to the Kyoshi Kojin that I talked about a bit ago. Next. The village closer up. Wang Meng's hand here is not the highly skilled hand that painted Gudger Tran moving, which we saw before this. Both because of age, this is a later work, and by intent, the drawing is charmingly... False naive, false naive, devoid of conspicuous con refinements. This is Wang Meng, the cultivated amateur, uh, painting a picture to be treasured in the temple and shown to fortunate visitors, perhaps those who made substantial contributions to the temple. Next, please. A bit further on, rolling leftward, we see the gateway that marks the beginning of the pilgrimage way proper. It has a tiled roof to preserve it, and diagonal supports to hold it up. The trees are a dense mixture of pines and leafy trees, the latter showing autumnal colors. Next. Rolling on, we mark with relief the end of the emperor's overlong inscription. He had them composed for him and wrote them out himself endlessly in his undistinguished hand. Tall pointed mountains are seen in the distance below, and lower hills, nearer ones at right, further ones at left with a broad valley between. Below and nearer, dense growths of pine trees, their green color contrasting with the autumnal reds of the deciduous trees. Next. In the middle distance on the slope of the hills are more thatched houses. Details like these emerge as one looks out of the richly textured and colored areas, the hillsides with bluish washers and dotting, the pines with their patterns of needles against green, the leafy trees as simple uprights with red and brown dien and washers. Next. As we roll on, the hills move further into distance, and the broad valley below them expands, with a river running through it, presumably flowing eastward from the interior toward the sea. On the nearer shore of this river is a field where a farmer can be seen plowing with an ox. Below, the pilgrimage road crosses a bridge over a stream, the stream that has appeared before at the base of the scroll and now flows inward to join the river above. Next. When we bend in closer to look at this upper part, we see the farmer plowing with his ox. The setting is shown as a fertile, prosperous region near the sea, with comfortable-looking peasants and villagers going about their occupations. It echoes, perhaps, the old distinction that I pointed out in Song period landscapes between the denizens of the scene portrayed and those who are passing through it. Next. 
A bit further on and nearer is another cluster of thatched houses, the village to which the farmer will return when his plowing is over. A bridge is seen over the river in distance. How much of this corresponded to the real place as Wang Meng knew it, we can't say. But he lays it out with a great air of assurance, never relaxing the energy of his vibrant execution. Next. Below, nearer to us, a man sits resting on the roadside, pausing in his journey toward the temple, or he may be returning from a visit to it. He looks leftward toward the temple, as does his servant who holds his donkey. The sinuous, wavering markings on the nearer rocks contribute to the overall surface energizing. Rolling the scroll and seeing it close up is a stimulating visual experience. Next, please. To the left of this, a white-robed man with a cane is standing on the bridge. A pine tree with twisting trunk is seen in lower right, while at the left, across the bridge and above, the dense curtain of pines and leafy trees hides the road. But the artist never slips into simple, simple repetition and area filling. Trunks and branches give surface variety and depth. Next, please. In the next section, the near distant hills are enlarged the far distant ones reduced to pale blue silhouettes. The stand of pine trees recedes into middle distance, and in lower left another stream flows beneath an arched bridge. Another road is entered from below to pass over this bridge and join the main pilgrimage road above. Next. Looking at the distant hills, we see low mists or fog between them and at their base. A few more thatched houses are partly seen above the pines and the far distant blue hills beyond. Wang Meng continues to draw our gaze in and out as we roll, roll on, never losing control over his spaces. Next. At the place below where the two roads come together, pilgrims are seen moving both ways. Coming in from lower left, a traveler on a donkey is accompanied by two servants, one behind carrying the luggage on a pole over his shoulder the other going ahead and pointing the way. Next. Above, on the road coming in from the temple, a Buddhist pilgrim wearing a yellow robe and a broad hat turns back toward his servant. The distinctions made in the figures, between lay figures and monks, economic classes and so forth, were no doubt much clearer to people of the time than they are to us, or certainly to me. Next. Here, seen closer up, is the traveler on the donkey with his two servants. The road they are following winds around, presumably between large rockeries. And what are the fine, dark, broken lines that hang down from the red leaf bush in the middle left? They must be some kind of plant that could be seen there. Wang Meng would not have made them up. Next. If we move in still closer, as I do in this super close detail, the amateurishness of the drawing becomes perhaps too apparent. But the scroll was not intended to be seen from so close. In seeing the real thing, one would almost have to rub his nose on it to see, see it like this, much to the alarm of the owner or the museum curator. Next. Below and further on, we see the arched bridge with two Buddhist pilgrims crossing it with their porters. On the further support for the bridge, between the stone arch that supports it and the upper surface, are several round circular markings in brown with small strokes radiating out from them. Are these the ends of logs set in some kind of concrete for strength? That's my best guess. Whatever they are, they represent again the sharp-eyed observation that underlies Wang Meng's paintings. One can imagine the monks of the temple and the visitors to it looking at it together and pointing out things familiar to them. Next. As we continue, the middle distance hills rise up to fill the entire upper part of the scroll, blocking any further view, further view into far distance. The dense plantings of pine trees continues below, with a few red-colored trees among them, and figures seen between their trunks. Next. The sudden rise of the hills features a projection similar to the dog's head form I spoke about before. It's silhouetted strongly against the more distant hill, with a distant bluish peak above and the stream below. Next. A single building is seen high up on a mountain ledge with a few pine trees of its own. 
This may be a building associated with the main temple below. The mountainsides are treated with the old parallel fold recessions, wavery texture strokes, and masses of dotting, with a few clusters of autumnal trees here and there. Next. In the spaces between pine trunks below, we see a group of horsemen approaching the temple. These are not Buddhist pilgrims, but men of some rank, two of them with red coats and officials' hats, others with blue and white coats. This is some official visit of high-ranking men, accompanied by servants walking before and behind them. Next. They are about to arrive, and we are about to arrive at last at the temple, which occupies the end of the scroll. The main group makes up an impressive, diagonally receding architectural complex, with its approach seen between the end of the row of pine trees, which now divides into two rows that rise to flank the buildings. Next. Two monks are seen at the bottom, then a square pond uh, in front of the main temple buildings, and then those buildings, the broad two-story main building, Hongkong in Japanese, with a courtyard behind it and another two-story hall behind, very much like temple complexes we can still see in Japan, the Horyuji, for instance. Next. The pond is in two rectangular parts and is lined with rocks of different shapes and colors. Without really knowing, specialists in temple architecture and design can tell us more, I would assume that it's used for some kind of ritual cleansing, washing, or simply symbolizes that, that idea. Bodies of water are associated with temples all over the world, and I recall reading a learned article about them, or book about them, about their significance long ago, but I can't remember it now. Next. Inside the main hall, seen through the openings, is a railing and the lower parts of two large Buddha sculptures. Uh, Yellow-robed monks are seen in front, inside and on the second story uh, uh, on a railed veranda. The monk in front has his hands raised in prayer or worship. Next. To the left of this, viewed strikingly from above and at an angle, is more of the temple complex, seen beyond another vertical cliff or rise of land. Wang Meng's ability to conceive and draw the whole building complex, as seen from this angle, among leafy trees and pines, is impressive, as is the whole conception and execution of this picture. Monks are seen here and there through the openings. Next. In the lower corner at the end of the scroll, we see, finally, two more monk visitors arriving from the other side, about to pass through a smaller grove of leafy trees, here with greenish and black masses of foliage beside the red. The head and shoulders of a single monk are seen through a break in the leafage, and the stream emerges again below. Next. Finally, a detail of the lower part of the very end of the scroll, showing the two arriving figures. But it also reveals a key feature that is worth our attention. The seals at the end, including two seals of the artist Wang Meng, have been cut off and then pasted back in. The speculation about this is that when Wang Meng fell into political troubles at the beginning of the Ming, he was accused of involvement in a seditious campaign to overthrow the new emperor, and he was imprisoned and died in prison. At that time, his seals may have been cut off the painting to guard against the danger of the temples being associated with him, and then after some time had passed, the seals were pasted back on. No painting by Wang Meng dated after the fall of the Yuan survives, perhaps for that reason. So, a bit of politics and personal tragedy is injected at the end of this lecture. How does it affect our reading of the painting? Not at all, some would say. Max Lohr always argued that works of art are timeless personal creations, independent of history and special surrounding circumstances. I myself, by contrast, used to make a case for Wang Meng's involvement in political issues of his time being somehow reflected in the, how to put it, strongly engaged character of his paintings, just as Nizan's eremitism his avoidance of involvement is reflected in his paintings, which can be read as emblems of disengagement. I'm certainly not going to elaborate on that argument here and now, but I'll leave it to resonate in your heads 
as a suitable ending for this very long lecture as I myself disengage and go off to rest. Thank you.